Some of you know that until the end of last month, I was assisting in the Diocese of Virginia, and now I'm happy to say that I'm here in the Diocese of Maryland doing much the same work. But part of my work there was to supervise our deacons. There were about 25 deacons in the diocese. And one of the things the deacons had to do each year was to write the bishop a letter during the season of Advent talking about what they were doing both professionally, how their family was, and other aspects of their life. And I received one letter that was so moving and so timely, I asked the deacon if I might quote from his letter in my sermon today. And so I'm going to do that. He will, of course, remain anonymous, but his words, I think, will speak to many of us. He writes, Something is happening in the world that alarms me. This feeling goes back well before the time of the current president, but he has certainly made it impossible to ignore. When I was growing up, there was an ideal, belief, shared conviction that was solid and fundamental to our country and our society. To be certain, we had troubles and failures but the country felt solid. Our apparent prosperity and stability feel very shaky. A house built on sand, and I feel a storm is raving. The storm, whatever form it may take, derives its energy from something spiritual, and I feel the church is being called to stand in the breach and somehow confront the darkness. At a, minimum, at a minimum, there is a growing anxiety that is making us tribal in our politics. Paralyzed in the face of the work that we clearly need to do, like climate change, environmental degradation, health care, and a host of other issues. What is God's message to this country now? What will, this still, what will still the wind and calm the fear and our anger? So I feel the stage is set for us to speak to the world today what that message is and how to say it. This is what stirs in me a sense of bewilderment. I long for others who share this burden. And then, it may be that I just need counseling or medication. <laughs> what, do, what do you think? Well, I spent a long time pondering what I thought because I knew, A, that I identified strongly with all of the sentiments and fears that he expressed and the frustrations. And I also knew that it would not be appropriate to answer without prayerfully considering how to address his question. One of the things I did was to get his permission to share this. Um, after I spoke with him and after he had received my response. I began by responding that I felt entirely at home with the way in which he viewed America and the anxiety he felt. And I feel that there are many of you who share that same anxiety and feeling. And that I was also mystified by what the church should in fact, can in fact, be productively saying in our own culture. But I also assured him that I felt that somewhere the answer lay in proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ and not being shy about living into our baptismal covenant which is why this is very appropriate for today. We celebrate the baptism of our Lord, and after the sermon, I will be leading you in the baptismal covenant, which is a reminder that Christianity, although it is based on belief, is largely a lived religion. The second part of that baptismal covenant is the most important one. The creed we can afford to differ on, but, the things we need to do as a result of our belief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
Those are things that we need to be whole about, that we need to be testifying and speaking out about, and even more, living out about. It's complicated in our culture. I became aware many years ago, now long before the current administration, maybe 25 years ago, somebody told me after a sermon, you know that the, some of the words that you used are perceived by conservatives to be flashpoints, to be, um, in a sense, uh, words that mean something else, words that uh, uh, have a different kind of meaning for them. I found out the word they were referring to was justice, that if I spoke of justice, this immediately became a catchword for many people as a progressive agenda, especially a progressive political agenda. Now, things have gotten a lot worse since then. I mean, we are constantly accused if we speak out of our Christian experience and out of our faithfulness to Jesus Christ as being co-opted by a political party or speaking out of a partisan sense rather than speaking out of our Christian faith. And so I don't know about you, I sometimes clam up about this, not a lot, um, <laughs> but I think many of you may feel that you just can't speak honestly because you will be accused of being partisan. So understanding that honesty and fair dealing and being above board are all Christian values. So if you criticize the president about his blatant dishonesty, which happens on a daily basis, you were seen as partisan. And of course, if you want to see social justice in this country and economic justice and a fair deal for everybody, you are likely to be branded as partisan. And if you believe that we should be doing more to alleviate the poor and really doing things that will be helpful for people who seem to fall through the various nets in our country, you are also likely to be branded as partisan. We need to be bold about saying, these do not come for us from a partisan perspective. Long before there was a Democratic or Republican party, these values have been held by Christians since the very beginning. Justice and equality and fairness and honesty, these are Christian values that have been proclaimed both in word but mostly in action. We need to be very clear that we speak from our faith in Jesus Christ and that is our motivation and then let the chips fall where they will. And of course, that will not endear us to some people. But I think the time is very necessary for us to be more outspoken on these issues. There is a frightening amount of silence. Silence in the Senate and the House, silence in our national government, people just remaining silent in the face of what we all understand from our upbringing to be immoral behavior. I think the deacon was quite correct. Most of us can remember a time in this country where we would at least be united in our sense of what was important, united in what we felt was going to be a ground on which we could all stand, something we could all agree on, regardless of which political party we belong to. But now that is much more complicated, but not less necessary. And a lot of that goes back to our baptismal covenant. One of the first things we will promise in that baptismal covenant is that we will resist evil. We're not just speaking about trying not to be evil ourselves. That's the easy battle. We're talking about resisting evil as we see it in our country, in the world. Evil as it is being practiced by people in high positions. Evil as we see it around us. 
We will also, almost immediately, promise that we will proclaim, by good, proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, both by word and by action, by behavior. Now, it's a lot easier to say these things than it is to live them. But if we are living this out, we really are doing our job as Christians. It means treating other people as equals. It means defending the rights of persons who are poor or downtrodden. It means sharing our resources and setting our priorities for how we spend our money, how we vote, how we do all kinds of other things. We will also be promising that we will see Christ in every person, which means those persons who oppose us. Christianity was radical because Jesus insisted that we should love our enemies and do good to those who persecute us and to live a different lifestyle than the people living around them in the Roman Empire. And I'm comforted by reading the book of Acts when I realize that a small group of Christians, most of them not educated, most of them, almost none of them powerful, most of them not even eloquent, managed to change people's hearts and change an empire, not by their theology, but how they lived their theology, how they treated other people. When presiding bishop Michael Curry first came out with his program of the way of love, I frankly looked at it and I thought, this is overly simplistic. But over the two years that I've been grappling with that, I have realized that Michael was on to something all along. It's the power of our love that has the ability to change hearts, people, even, I think, nations. It's the ability of ourselves to love self-sacrificially. This is where the cover of your bulletin comes in beautifully this morning because it links crucifixion and baptism. If you look at that cover, you can see that it is a crucifix descending into the water, or might, we might even say ascending out of the water, because it's a reminder to us that in our baptism, we have died with Christ and been reborn into a new life where we are called to make sacrifices, the sacrifices that love calls us to make, the respect that love calls us to show to every other human being, living out a different dynamic and a different dynamic from the world in which we live and certainly from the world in which Jesus lived, which I think was not such a different world actually. We have become like that first century, sharply divided in an empire that is rapidly closing in and collapsing around us and where people have little respect for one another or for different points of view. Remember those early Christians when you make your baptismal covenant vows. They stood together and by standing together and loving one another and living into the gospel imperative of speaking out and living out, they changed society, which is our job, the job of Christians in every time a job that is desperately needing to be done in our own time. Amen. Amen.